Good afternoon. We're here to tell you what we refer to as the greatest untold story in the history of our nation, the story of the Buffalo Soldier. On July 28, 1866, Congress passed an expect authorizing the formation of six peacetime colored regiments. There were 2,000, 9th and 10th, 4 infantry, 38, 39, 40, and 41st infantry. Three years later, when they reorganized the infantry, they became 24th and 24th infantry. Thus, being the 19th of Carolina, 24th and 25th infantry, we refer to as Buffalo Soldiers. Uh, shortly after the Civil War, John Bahar found a lot of blacks came into the military for a better way of life. Their pay was $13 a month. They had three meals a day, free medical, a place to stay, and clothes that you see us wear every day. Now, while they were on the frontier, they had many duties, mostly they built folks forts for the white troops. They escorted wagon trains. They guarded the railroad. They guarded water holes. They charted map untrained areas. And while they were doing this on the western frontier, they came in contact with the Plain Indian. Now the Plain Indian had never seen a black man before. And when he saw that buffalo soldier, he was reminded when he looked at the trooper's hair, he reminded them of the mane of the buffalo. When he looked at the troop of skin, it reminded them of the skin of the buffalo. But most importantly, boys and girls, it was the tenacity in which that troop was fought. The Indian remembered him for the way he fought. Well, in July of 1867, Private John Ramble of the 9th Cavalry was assigned the duty of escorting two hunters on a hunting expedition. Shortly after they left the fort, they were attacked by a renegade Indian bunch. Uh, the hunters were killed early in the scrimmage. John Randall was shot in the arm, leg, and his horse was shot out from under him. He managed to crawl away to an embankment that was dug out and defend off the renegade Indians until help from the nearby fort could reach them. Once the help reached them, the Indians turned and ran back. They just said that when the Indians got back, they told fellow Indians that the white man had a new soldier, one who looked and fought like a buffalo. And that again was one of the part of the ways that they gave the name Buffalo Soldier, the highly respected black individual soldiers. I want to share with you today a story, the legacy of Trooper Henry O. Flipper. Now, Henry Flipper did a lot of firsts. Let me share with you what Henry O. Flipper accomplished. Now, he was born uh, in 1856. Thomasville, Georgia, and he was born as a slave, and it was only until after the Civil War he was able to gain his freedom. In 1873, Henry O. Flipper petitioned his congressman for approval and acceptance into West Point, and after numerous letter writing, his congress finally approved his acceptance and submitted his name to West Point for admission into West Point. And so he was admitted into West Point in 1873. Now, Henry O. Flipper was not the first African-American admitted into West Point. Now, between 1870 and 1898, there were 12 African-Americans that entered into West Point. Now, ironically, only six of those African Americans even completed the first semester at West Point. But Henry Flipper, he endured. He was there for four years. Now, his four years consisted of being isolated. He didn't have any friends, male or females. Now, can you imagine eating breakfast alone? No one wanted to be with him or associated with him, eating lunch alone. No one wanted him to be there. 
and they wouldn't associate with him. Eating dinner alone, no one wanted to be with him. They didn't want him there. And at the end of the day, to study alone. Imagine going to college for four years in isolation, not being wanted, not being desired, but having to meet those challenges and expectations of all the other cadets at West Point. But Henry Flipper, he endured all that. He graduated as a second lieutenant, as an engineer officer in 1877. Now, Henry Flipper was the first African-American to graduate from West Point. He moved on from graduation and was assigned out west, West Texas, and became the first African-American officer to command U.S. Army regular soldiers. Now, he was assigned to 10th Cavalry, a troop. Henry Flipper was a individual who was very knowledgeable about the business of being an officer and an engineer. And so this captain that was assigned as the commander of eight troop was responsible for teaching Lieutenant Flipper about being a cavalryman. And they became friends, but the white soldiers didn't like that friendship that was uh, established by uh, his captain, and so they began to complain. Now, the captain's family was there at, at the military installation, and Henry became friends with the captain's sister-in-law, who also came there to live with him. And they would go out riding from time to time, because Henry was a good horseman. He knew good horsemanship, and the story has it that he often taught her good horsemanship. They became friends. And the white soldiers, they didn't like that as well. He was the quartermaster during his first assignment. But those individuals who did not accept Henry Flipper, they began to complain to the captain. Nonetheless, the captain said, I invite Lieutenant Flipper to my quarters because he is an officer and a gentleman. And that's the same thing that I would do for any other officer. That didn't satisfy those white soldiers, those white officers. Uh, so trouble was brewing. The captain was reassigned, and so was Henry o. Flipper, was reassigned to another installation. Lieutenant Flipper was assigned to uh, Fort Davis, also in West Texas. He was assigned as a quartermaster. He became uh, the quartermaster for the installation in charge of funds that were collected on the installation. So the story has is that some of the white officers, uh, they somehow took some $2,000 and hid it from Lieutenant Flipper. Now, Lieutenant Flipper could not account for the money. And they say that Lieutenant Flipper then tried to cover up because he knew he didn't take it, but he couldn't prove he had taken it. Lieutenant Flipper then was also uh, brought before uh, military officers and charged with embezzlement. However, now there were other officers, black officers, they raised enough money to replace the $2,000. That $2,000 back then equates to some $53,000 in this day and time, a lot of money. But they proceeded with the court martial. They did not convict him of embezzlement but they did say because he covered up and lied to the officers, they gave him a dishonorable discharge because of conduct unbecoming of an officer. So Henry O. Flipper was discharged from the Army after serving five years in the Army. Now, Lieutenant Flipper, he went on to serve in the U.S. government in various positions. He passed away and his family then petitioned to the U.S. Army to get his discharge upgraded. They were successful. In 1976, Henry O. Flipper discharge uh, was upgraded to an honorable discharge. Additionally, the family continued to petition uh, the government and 
the commander in chief at that time, President William Jefferson Clinton, 1999. Then President Clinton pardoned Lieutenant Henry O. Flipper and therefore set in the record straight that he was wrongfully um, convicted of what he was charged for and therefore eradicated his conviction and ensured that he had a record of distinction as an honorably discharged officer in the United States Army. Henry O. Flipper, the first African-American to graduate from West Point, the first African-American officer to lead U.S. Army regular troops, a true hero. Some said she wanted to make her own way <laughs> so that she would not have to depend on family or friends to support her. That may be her story, and that may not be. I'll let you be the judge. The Kathy Williams story. Kathy Williams was born in independent Missouri. Her father was a free man. Her mother was enslaved and in bondage to William Johnson and wife. William Johnson was a wealthy plantation owner who lived on the outskirts of Jefferson City, Missouri. During Kathy's Earl adolescent years, she was a house servant on Johnson's plantation. During the onset of the uh, Civil War, the Union soldiers came and they occupied Jefferson City, Missouri. And during that time, all slaves, captured slaves, were considered contraband and were used in various military support, such as laundry, laundress, nurses, and cooks. Kathy Williams was forced to join the 8th Indiana Infantry Volunteer Regiment. They wanted her to be a cook. She had never been, had never cooked because she's always been a house girl. So she traveled with the soldiers and marched with them to their various um, battles. She went from Georgia to Arkansas to Louisiana marching with the soldiers. She learned to cook when she became uh, Arkansas. And she traveled with the soldiers. At one time, she was transferred to Little Rock, Arkansas, where some some report says that that maybe in the first place she saw some um, black men serving, and that maybe where she decided that that would be where she would like that would be what she wanted to do. Not sure, but that's how the story goes. Um, at the end of the Civil War. Kathy Williams returned to, to Missouri, maybe in hopes of finding her family, but she returned to Missouri. And in November, on November the 15th, 1866, she enlisted in the 38th Infantry um, Regiment as a soldier. She changed her name from Kathy Williams to William Kathy in order to enlist. She was given a courtesy physical, so it was easy for her to fit and as a male to serve um, in the infantry. So she served a total, she enlisted for a total of three years, but she only served two because prior to her joining the military, she had been traveling with the um, Union soldiers. So they been marching um, in the end kind of weather, may have taken a toll on her. So soon after she enlisted, she was hospitalized. And um, it was seen that she made her smallpox. Um, she joined her unit later on in um, New Mexico. Now, it's reported that she was hospitalized a total of five times, uh, four or five times before it was discovered that she was a woman. Two people knew that she was a female, 
but they didn't say anything wrong. My cousin and a close family friend, but they didn't tell her secret. She um, would go to the, uh, go on sick call um, a variety of times, and but during those times, no one discovered that she was a female. So some report says that um, maybe she wanted to. Um, dispose, expose herself and let someone know that she was a female. She could have been tired of being in the military because they're infantry soldiers are soldiers who go to battle on foot. So Kathy was a foot soldier. This weapon is the type of weapon that Kathy Williams would have, would have used during her, during her time in service. The equipment is this equipment that she would have to go from place to place, her big role and all is all was carrying on her back. My canteen, somewhere for me to cook. All of this was somewhere for her to cook was all on her person. So after serving for two years and maybe she got tired, that's what some report says, she revealed herself. So the post surgeon reported her to the post commander who later discharged her and at some reports, they have characterized her as uh, unfit for duty because she was hospitalized so many times. But as a soldier, she served her country. She um, did guard duty like all the other soldiers did guard duty. Um, she worked and did everything that a soldier would do as a male soldier. Uh, so after the two years, she... Got, they discharged her from the military. She should have her discharge papers. We found the papers. Now, it wasn't until 1948 that women were allowed to serve. However, other women did serve, but none were, she is considered the only female buffalo surgeon. So she ended up in um, Trinidad, uh, Colorado, and she was, became a cook because she learned to cook in the military and she also had a boarding house. So during this time, um, it was not normal for black women or African-American women to be uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, Kathy Williams was an entrepreneur. Um, she learned the trade that the military taught her and she used it to take care of herself. But while she was in Pablo, Colorado, her she got married. And her husband, it didn't last long because he stole her horses and some money. She tracked him down and she had him arrested. She said she really liked that area because the people were nice to her there. She ended up in um, Trinidad, Colorado. Um, the last place is where she's known to be. So back in um, 1891, she started, her help started to fail. And she, and she, so she wanted to get some assistance from the military. Now, because she enlisted as a male, they had her name as William Kathy and not Kathy Williams. So maybe that's the reason why they denied her pension. Um, maybe because the government didn't want to let it know that a woman actually served in the military. Whatever the reason is, they denied her pension. She came in to um, the interview on crutches. All her toes were amputated, and they said she was not disabled. So we tell her story so that people will know that whether she enlisted cardiacally or not, she still served, and she was a couple of soldier and proud of it, I'm sure. Um, but we tell her story so that people will know that there was a female who did serve honorably in the um, United States Army. So she ended up somewhere living in Colorado. Um, so in 2015, the Buffalo Soldiers went to uh, Trinidad, Co uh, Colorado and was placed a reef on her in an area where the reef fed with the thing as As I end, I would like to say to you, the story of Kathy Williams is very interesting. I would encourage you, I've only given you a tidbit of the Kathy Williams story. I uh, encourage you to read the story and think about what she did during that time and how you today 
can do some of those same things, but you have to set your mind to it and be willing to go through some things. Um, education would have been a very good key because then she could have positioned herself differently to um, explain her case or talk to the attorneys, that um, the lawyers that was representing her, but she didn't understand all the things, and so she got denied uh, a pension that she should have been entitled to. So I would say to you, read and learn about Miss Kathy Williams or William Kathy. You can find it either way. And I use several sources to get my information. And there's, the sources are available online or you can go to the library. But I encourage you to read the Kathy Williams story. Afternoon. I'm going to talk to you about feeding the troops. Feeding the troops is the responsibility of the commissary department. Now, all armies have a commissary department. Now, the commissary department has three duties. They buy the food for the troops, they store the troops' food in the warehouse, then they issue it to the troops when it's needed. Now, when they issue the troop, the food is called rations, and it's normally Supposed to last for three days, and it's pretty much like they do in the military today. They say a three day draw, so they draw enough ration for three days. Now, the food the Buffalo soldiers ate was mostly meat and bread. The meat was pork, which came from pigs, or beef that came from cow. Most often, they had pork, and the bread they had was hardtack. This was a water, flour, salt mixture that made this bread known as hardtack and it's pretty hard they even call it nickname for worm castle because worms would get in it sometimes and also they call it tooth dullers because they would hurt their teeth but the most uh exciting thing about the hardtack is when they had it a lot of times they would mix it with the salt pork after it was cooked to thin it out and they would have a dish called scallywag. Now, when they used this beef, they had to eat it right away. So in the winter times, they could store the beef pretty good. But in the summer, they either had to make jerky, which was a slow process where they would cut the meat up, lay it out on the fire, let it dry out. And then when the troops got ready to go out for lunch, they may take jerky with them, may have some pork left. So they had other rations. But the main food that the Buffalo soldiers ate was meat and bread. And then when the rations came in, they sometimes they had flour, sugar, pepper, tea, coffee, molasses, cornmeal, dried beans, vegetables. And the interesting thing about the vegetables was a lot of times they would grow their own if they were set up in a situation where they could. The troop would have one trooper from each company, and they would call him a gardener. And his sole responsibility was to grow vegetables. Uh, he would grow tomatoes, onions, carrots, potatoes, and he would process, cut up the hogs and stuff when they got it. And they had special dish that we'll talk about a little later on that they used to cook for each other and things that they enjoyed cooking. Now, when they got up in the morning, usually they had a breakfast consisting of hardtack, and fat bag or pork, lawn, any part of the hog they could cut up and cook. So they would have coffee also. Now, the, the interesting thing about the coffee was uh, they called it cowboy coffee. So basically what they did was they took coffee grounds and they placed it in hot water and they allowed it to boil. And then once that coffee boiled, they would let it sit. And then people would say, well, gracious, there are coffee grounds all over, the, all over the coffee. So what they would do is they would take water and they would pour it around the rim of the coffee pot and let it sit for about five minutes. And that would let the coffee grounds go to the bottom of the pot. So when the troopers got ready to drink coffee a little later on, they would pour coffee into the cup, no grounds, and drink now, when they got ready to go after that breakfast, they would sometimes be out on the prairie all day 
around doing different things. So they would also take food with them. Uh, the trooper would come in to the, to the mess hall with the tent, and uh, he would have his saddle bag, and he'd give me his handkerchief. And I'd take his handkerchief, and uh, I'd put him some, some jerky in there. I'd put in some hard tack in there. I'd fold that up for him. And he'd step it down in his saddle bag, and he'd be on the way. Now, when we traveled out to the western frontier, especially coming from California, it would take a long process to get food from California out to where it needed to be. Sometimes it would take as much as a month, and they would have wagon trains with as much as 100 wagons. And for instance, if they were to have a barrel of flour that cost them $5 in California, by the time it got to the western frontier, they had incurred a $25 cost with transportation and things like that. Now, while they were out on the western frontier, water and wood were some things that were kind of hard to find at times. And depending on where they were, how access they had to get water or the wood. Now, most of the time, they would buy wood from the people out on the open market. Uh, as you see, we have wood stored here. What they would do is they would go out and they would take two wagons and three troopers and they would go out on the local economy and they would buy wood. When they came back with the wood, the wood was used mostly for cooking. And uh, one of the times, sometimes the officer would have wood to make a fire to keep his tent warm, but it's used mostly for cooking. Now the water source was a little bit different. The water they carried in the canteens for the individual troops but for the company, they would carry it in barrels. And what they would have to do oftentimes, they would have to go out on water runs. And they would go to ponds, streams, and rivers, anywhere they could find water to bring the water back. A lot of times when they went out to ponds, the water would be stacked. The water in the wood was going to talk briefly about the canned goods. Now, a lot of times that they would have uh, canned peaches, uh, canned potatoes uh, and things, vegetables, they would carry in cans and bring out. In addition to that, they would have uh, supplement their diets about hunting, fishing, and they would have deer, buffalo, fish, or rabbit when they could find it. Uh, and pretty much uh, anything that they could do to supplement the diet. Now, when we talked about the garden, we talked about the guy. Uh, that, that, uh, that did the gardening and that was his only responsibility but in addition to that they had garden, they had vegetables that came in sometimes but it would be time to time for a while before they got in If you were part of the Western Expansion, and you were in a wagon train or a stagecoach, and you start having problems with an Indian attack or Mexican bandoleros, uh, if you were rescued by the Buffalo soldiers, more than likely you were rescued by African American soldiers. One third of the soldiers serving on the Western Plains were African Americans. I know that we probably looked at a lot of cowboys and Indians, but most of the time you see the white cavalry. But again, one third of the cavalry serving on the Western Plains were Buffalo soldiers. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit today about horsemanship and about how important the horse was to Buffalo soldiers during the Western expansion. Uh, like most of you have your bicycles and your parents have cars and trucks, and it's important to have transportation. The horse was an extremely important piece of equipment, if you want to call it that, for the buffalo soldiers. You remember you had to have a good horse in order to perform your mission. Uh, you've seen the movies with cowboys and Indians and horses running at a full gallop. And, of course, 
he gets shot or falls down, uh, we know that the horse isn't really shot. The truth is it's a well-trained horse uh, who has a lot of trust in his trainer to be able to do that maneuver. Horses are extremely smart. One of the things that happens once you were assigned to one of the regiments, and once you were assigned there, uh, you report to the barn sergeant. The barn sergeant would assign you a mount, and that's what the horses were called back in the day, it was the amount for the soldiers. Sometimes you get a horse who had already been broken and trained uh, and was part of the stable. Sometimes you get a horse who was partially trained, partially broken, and therefore you and the horse had to <laughs> train it together. Uh, this is Friday, and you can see Friday can get a little bit rambunctious sometimes. Uh, Friday is about 12 years old. Uh, she's a good horse uh, and relies on me to take care of her. Uh, when the Buffalo soldiers were on a mission uh, and it came time to, to rest, the first thing that would happen was that it was time to water and before you took care of yourself, you take care of your horse first. Horses always have priority uh, on the Western Plains. One of the things uh, that people ask me all the time is, uh, how do you get the horse to do this and how do you get the horse to do that? Horses are extremely sensitive. Uh, if you're on a horse and you're nervous, the horse is going to sense that. And he's going to be nervous too. He's going to be wondering why you're nervous. The other thing uh, with the horse is that you have to train, spend time training him and spending time with them so they can feel half confidence in you and, and will do what you ask. This horse, horses generally weigh from 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. And believe me, you can't do anything with this horse if the horse doesn't want you to. An example is if there was something going on with the horse's hoof and we need to check, you reach down and you grab the hoof and lift it. Now, if that horse didn't want me to lift that hoof, I would not be able to do that. But again, uh, it's the training, the time that you spend with the horse uh, that's important. I want to talk a little bit about the equipment. I can get some assistance here from Trooper Home. I want to show you this is what it was a cavalry halter complete with lines. This is what this is uh, a replica of what they use during the Western campaigns. This is an actual bridle for head stall with U.S. cavalry on those. This is a, a replica of uh, the, the head stalls that they used back during the cavalry day. This is McCullough's saddle. Saddle is great for the horse, but not good for man. I've ridden uh, this saddle numerous times in parades and other events. And I'm telling you, at the end of a good long parade, you're ready to get out of the saddle. But again, it's a great saddle for the horse. You probably can't see the vent in the saddle, uh, but it's vented for the horse. This is a typical bedroll. Normally, most of your extra clothing and other stuff, uh, sleeping blankets would be in this particular row. This one is kind of a weather row for rainy weather, for dust, and those kinds of things. This is the utility rope. This rope is used to do a number of things. If a wagon gets stuck, pulling a wagon uh, out of uh, the muck and mire that it might be in. Uh, this is the typical saddlebag. Can't do that very well. But all of your stationery and other little personal items would generally be in, stored in your uh, saddlebags. 
And these are extremely important. This is the, obviously a canteen. Uh, there are two on this particular tack. Again, even if it was uh, somewhere where we had to stop for water and we weren't at a lake or some kind of little water hole, the horse would always get the drink first before we manned up. Okay. And I want to share with you this. This is the Sharps Carbon, 50 cal. And uh, if you remember the presentation that Trooper Rogers did, she talked about Kathy Williams. Kathy Williams was in the infantry. If you notice, her weapon was an entirely different weapon. It was a big musket. This was designed for the cavalry. Uh, it's a little bit lighter than the musket. It's designed, uh, in fact, the strap I have here is part of the equipment. You would fasten it on so that if you are riding and you lose handle of the weapon, it, will, it stays with you on the horse. So you don't actually lose the weapon. And that certainly is an important thing. In addition, uh, they would often use these for rabbits, deer, and other kind of things. It was a good source of, of providing food uh, when they were out on the Western Plains. That's basically the equipment. Again, horse were very important to the cavalrymen. Uh, it meant them getting their mission accomplished. Uh, they were expert horsemen. You know, during times when they were uh, in camp or in garrison, they would often have riding competition. They were excellent rodeo guys. They were excellent steeplechase, a number of things. Uh, as a matter of fact, they actually taught horsemanship at West Point. So they were excellent horsemen. Uh, I'd encourage you to, to go online and spend some time researching and spending some time talking about or looking at uh, the Buffalo Soldiers and their time on the Western Frontier. Thank you, sir.